In this episode, I'm going to go over the effects I used in the song during the mixing process, as well as the outboard mixing and effects setup I typically use. To begin with, I like to set up my project specifically for mixing when that time comes. I recommend creating a new version of your existing project, as it's always helpful to be able to go back to your songs in their creative stage in case of revisions or additions. The first thing I like to do is to categorize all of my tracks neatly and accordingly. For example, I like to add an all caps prefix on all tracks which delineate what they are. Drums, rhythm guitars, lead guitars, etc. This helps to see what's what at a quick glance and it's helpful when you have a large project with tons of tracks. Then I create a folder for each specific type of track and create a bus for each foldered group. This is so that I can do overall effects processing on each instrument type and also in the case of outboard summing, have specific channels to assign to my summing mixer. I use an SSL AlphaLink MADI AX converter, which allows for 24 channels of analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. So I make sure to keep my stems to 22 ins and outs so that my final two track master can be printed back in the project. Another thing I like to do is to start with the basic effects I plan to use. I always do a few reverbs and delays, so I have some flexibility on those for individual instruments and stems. I have a Bricasti M7 hardware stereo reverb processor, so I patch that in, and I usually assign the reverb which I want to be the most realistic to that unit since it excels at realistic spaces. In this case, it's a studio ambience I have on the Bricasti. Since I wanted this song to have a live feel, I chose a far studio ambience that I could send a large amount of the tracks to in order to give them all a cohesive sense of space. To begin with, taking a look at the drums, I used TuneTrack Superior Drummer for this song. One of the things I really like about this software is both the amount of microphones we have access to and the control we have over those microphones in terms of bleed. I generally tend to disable all bleed in the inside kick drum mic, the top snare mic, and the tom mics. This allows me to compress those particular elements more heavily without bringing up all of the ringing and cymbal bleed in between the hits, so I can essentially get more punch from the downbeats without raising the overall noise floor. Taking a look here, I did a mid-range boost on the kick drum in order to bring out more of the tone of the drum, and I added some distortion to the top snare mic via Soundtoy's Decapitator plugin. That just adds some extra grit to the drums and creates a more classic console sound with the harmonic saturation it adds. I have the snare being sent to a lexicon tiled room reverb, which is a pretty classic reverb preset for drums due to the large, wide and quick ambience it adds. I also have the snare being sent to two different delays. Firstly to a Waves H delay with a super short 16 milliseconds delay time, and then to the Universal Audio EP34 tape echo with a tempo synced eighth note delay. The Waves delay is super short and wide, which makes the snare take up a larger space in the stereo spectrum for extra heft. The tape echo adds a nicely timed 8th note retro style echo, which I like to use to really add that classic 70s rock sound. You can see that I didn't add any individual effects to many of these drum tracks. I find that, especially with Superior Drummer, playing with the particular microphone balances between tracks is a more useful way to arrive at the drum sound I want than adding a ton of individual effects and mangling those on every track. This is a personal preference, but I think these days it's very easy to abuse and overuse plugins just for the sake of it, since we all have access to so many of them. At the end of the day, if I choose good tones to start, which is something I really try to do from the outset, I don't have to do as much to the files later on. I did do some relatively subtle EQing and overdriving to the ambient mics here. The room mics tend to be the microphone set I process the most heavily with drums. Smashing those can really add the sense of movement I like to hear in a rock drum track. Taking a look at the drum bus, this is where I do most of the processing. I have the whole kit being compressed by the Universal Audio Fairchild MK2 compressor. I find this compressor adds a nice pillowy thickness to source tracks, and with a boomier kick like this one, it was perfect for enhancing the deeper aspects of the kick drum. Then I'm doing a pretty drastic high shelf boost to add snap to the snare drum and some sizzle to the cymbals. A small mid-range EQ boost helps the kit cut through the mix during the heavy ending especially. 
Then I'm smashing the Kush Audio UBK1 compressor pretty hard to give an in-your-face smack to the kit and to bring up some residual ambience. One of the really cool things about this compressor is that it has a parallel blend for both the saturation and the compression. And as you can see here, I'm letting a good amount of the saturation through, around 70% or so, but only around 30% of the compression so that the drums still have heavy transients getting through. Parallel compression is a really great thing to experiment with on your drum bus, as you can go from subtle all the way to drastic transient and tonal shaping. And then the whole drum bus here is being sent to the Bricasti to give the together with the band sound. For the percussion, I didn't do much other than to send the hand percussion, the snaps and the claps, to the same quick wide waves echo so they stay a little more present in the mix. Then the percussion bus also gets a high-end boost and some natural ambience via the Bricasti reverb. The bass guitar has no effects inserted at all, just some ambience also via the Bricasti. Nice and simple since I spent some time sculpting the bass tone during the tracking stage. Again, no effects just for the sake of it. I really like to try and only use them when necessary. For the electric guitars, they're all high-passed at just under 105 Hz. I find that it's very useful to take unnecessary low end out of electric guitars. This can be a bit tricky as when I solo the guitar this way it can sound thin, but you have to keep in mind how it's going to sit with all of the other instruments and whether keeping the low end information in the guitars will just muddy up the bass, which it can definitely tend to do if you're not careful. Electric guitars in the context of a big rock mix is one of those instruments which can get problematic if you don't properly assess them in context, sonically speaking. And then the whole guitar bus gets a small mid-range boost for some note clarity and some ambience via the Bricasti. The mandolin and banjo stem gets processed by the UAD Ampex ATR-102 tape simulator to round off some of the brightness inherent to the instruments. Then once that's done, I took that rounded off top end and added some of it back via the Equality EQ. So essentially I ended up with a still natural top end, but less of the digital style high frequencies I would have had without the tape simulator. Then this stem also gets some ambience, as well as some eighth note tape delay, just to add a touch of extra movement to the strumming patterns. It's a subtle thing, but it adds up. The keyboards in the track went to a different reverb altogether, as I wanted those to have more of an 80s synth feel to them. So the Exponential Audio Phoenix Verb Medium Hall preset is what I used for a more dramatic effect. Combining different reverbs and reverb types in a song is a really fun thing to experiment with, and it'll teach you a lot about early and late reflections and how they combine together to create a unique sense of space. The orchestra bus all gets a pretty heavy high frequency boost, as I really wanted those to contribute a sense of air as well as melody to the bridge and the ending of the song. Those are all then sent to the same medium hall as the keyboards in order to add the same dramatic effect. Looking at the vocals, all of my vocal tracks are being compressed pretty heavily by the Steinberg Neve 5043 Portico compressor, which has a fantastically analog sound and behavior. They're also all high-passed at 105 Hz to let only the relevant vocal frequencies through. Both my and Bethany's lead vocal have a lot of processing going on. First, they're sent to the Bricasti for the in-the-room sound, then to the UA EP34 tape echo for a short 80 millisecond slapback delay, then to the Waves Reel ADT2V artificial double tracking effect to bring out the Beatles style vocal doubling effect. She was only 19 and I, I was only 23, so why did we have such a long lasting? This is a really cool and flexible plugin that can add a whole lot of vibe to your vocal recordings. By allowing you to have control over the doubling effect timing and allow the doubling to actually happen before your dry lead track, you can get some really cool doubling effects that'll instantly sound familiar to anyone who grew up listening to the Beatles and Pink Floyd classic recordings. And then lastly, the lead vocals are sent to the UAD EMT 140 plate reverb, which is a killer in the box plate reverb emulation. And that's just to add even more of a classic style vibe to things. So as you can see, there are a whole lot of different effects at work in this mix, and I highly recommend trying lots of different effects combinations in order to both learn how they work in tandem and to learn which ones really stand out for use in your productions. Having access to virtually unlimited amounts of plugins 
and so many different types of plugins is one of the best things about the advent of the digital age and something you should take full advantage of. I mentioned earlier about my summing setup, so I want to talk a bit about that. To be clear, summing is a process of sending your digital tracks out into an analog outboard mixer or a console in a box in order to have the signals combined and or affected in the analog domain. I find this to add a significant improvement in the stereo depth of a mix, and in the case of the summing mixers I use, which are the Thermionic Culture Fat Bustard 2 Limited Edition and Little Bustard Tube Summing Mixers, it adds a whole lot of analog heft and vibe to my tracks. I can pan all of my tracks in the analog domain, add harmonic saturation via the attitude knob, EQ via the Pultec style EQ, and add stereo width to the stereo mix if I want to. And that's all on top of the sound of the mullered tubes in the console, which adds a really nice thickness to the low end and softness on the extreme top end, as you'd expect from tube processing. Then I have the stereo mix going through a Thermionic Culture Phoenix Mastering Edition tube Verimu compressor in order to do some subtle compression and add even more tube goodness if I want it, followed by serial compression by a Cranesong STC-8 compressor. I consider this to be a Swiss Army Knife type compressor. It can range from very subtle and clean to dirty and extreme, but I generally use it as a clean dynamics attenuator when I want to make sure the final mix can be nice and loud, as taming some of the snap from the kick and the snare in the final mix can ensure that my overall loudness can be brought up without being smashed by the sharp transients in the limiting stage. While using two compressors in serial is not always the right thing for the song, Playing with combinations of compressors and utilizing them for their strength and tandem can yield some excellent results, and it'll also teach you a lot about compression as you experiment. After compression, I EQ the final mix if need be via a GML 8200 stereo EQ, which is famous for its pristine clarity and ability to do even extreme equalization while preserving the integrity of the source material. Then as a last step, this feeds into an Animod ATS-1 analog tape simulator, which is essentially a reverse-engineered analog tape machine, which was rebuilt using all analog building blocks. So you get all of the goodness of several different analog tape machines and tape formulations with zero latency and zero maintenance. This unit's seen a ton of use in my studio over the years and is definitely one of my desert island pieces of equipment. Then all of this gets printed back into the project as a two-track master stem ready for just a bit of loudness maximization, and then distribution and release into the world. So I realize that this is a whole lot of information and equipment, but the idea I want to emphasize is that while these tools are not necessary for every song or mix, they are the tools that I felt enabled me to get the song where I heard it in my head when I first wrote and recorded it. At the end of the day, they're all just methods and tools meant to be used to achieve art, and hopefully to be used with enjoyment and experimentation along the way. This is, after all, all about the music. I want to thank everyone for watching this series of The Soapbox. I've had a blast going through all the details with you. I'm Scott Fritz, signing off.